Uh, I have to tell you, it is a little bit humbling to be on the same stage as the Young Guns. Uh, what an impressive group of people. I mean, truly impressive. Uh, you know, I went to the University of Nebraska where the N on the football helmet stands for knowledge. And so I'm just a little, kind of give you a little time to catch up with that one. Uh, and I worked very hard to squeeze four years of uni into five, and I was able to do that. And so I, I feel pretty good about being here, but truly it was intimidating to be, to follow the young guns. And Andrew did a great job of, of setting up this presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Engage program that we have and really how, how we help people do a better job of, of connecting based on their values and why that's so important. This can be a four to eight hour training program, and we do have an online version now that we'll talk a little bit about as well. So in the next 35 minutes, I'm going to try to just basically cover the principles in kind of a high level, but it's also going to be interactive. So I will be asking you to participate in a couple of exercises as we go through this. So if you decide to nod off, I'll call on you first, just to give you fair warning uh, that that might be how it plays out. So the mission of the Center for Food Integrity is to really help today's food system earn consumer trust. And we talk about earning consumer trust because it's something that has to be earned and continue to be renewed every single day. It's something that we have to take uh, into consideration as a real business asset and be focused on earning it on an ongoing basis. Uh, historically, we've tried to defend our interest, which is very different than earning trust. Those are very, very different strategies. If you decide to earn trust, you're going to abandon some of the historical methods that we've tried to use to defend an interest. If you decide to defend an interest, you're not likely to be as successful in earning trust. Uh, a sample of some of the companies and organizations, associations with whom we work. Uh, we're very fortunate after 14 years that we've got enough credibility now that the Restaurant Association comes to us to ask us to write their position briefs on animal agriculture issues. We've got large companies who come to us for consultation, et cetera, on how they can best think about these issues in a very complex, rapidly evolving environment. But that's because we've spent 14 years working on building trust. It's a process and not an event. Uh, three kind of basic uh, strategic platforms for us, be a leading voice in a balanced public conversation about food. Uh, we do some consumer work. We also do a lot of uh, media work. We work with a lot of digital influencers. Uh, we, our digital influencer network has a, a total reach of about 15 million in the U.S., so we continue to work with them to, to build their capacity and understanding of food and agriculture. Uh, we want to align the culture of today's food system. Anytime you have a gap between performance and expectations, whether it's on your farm or in any other place, you're going to have conflict. So if we have a gap between consumer expectations and agriculture performance, we're going to have conflict. And so how do we close that? Sometimes it's by modifying performance, sometimes it's by modifying expectation, usually it's probably by doing some of both and trying to close that gap between performance and expectation. And then convene, empower, and support today's food system stakeholders, and that's really all about what Engage does. We want to support people and convene people and provide the tools so everyone can be more successful in building trust in who we are and what we do. And we do that through the Engage program. Uh, it is a fundamentally different process that we talk about in terms of how can we build the skills and capacity of the capability so we can all be more effective in building trust, in engaging, as opposed to simply telling people uh, what we think they need to know about who we are and what we do. So talking about today's agenda, we're going to cover a little bit about today's consumer and the erosion of trust, very top level. Uh, the research I'm going to share with you is from the U.S. We have a Canadian affiliate, so I don't have any Australia-specific data. It'll be up to you to interpret whether or not you think this data is valid in Australia or whether some or not some of the principles and trends you think would also be valid in Australia as well. The power of shared values. It is without question the most powerful tool that any of you have today. It's not your data. It's not your knowledge. It's who you are and your ability to connect with people based on your values is the greatest tool you have available to you. You don't need to be anything other than who you are because who you are is more than sufficient to be successful. And we'll talk about why that's the case and how we can empower you to do that. And then engage in three very simple steps and a little bit of consumer role play. And that's about all we're going to have time to cover in the, uh, in the 35 minutes this afternoon. So we'll keep moving. A lot of this is based on our research. We have several peer-reviewed and published models for what it takes to build trust. We do research, qualitative and quantitative research every single year. Uh, and then we work on continuing to build that database. And we want to share that very broadly again, to try and encourage understanding. And increasingly, what people are looking for is, don't tell me about the data, tell me what the data says, and help me interpret what it means and what I should then do with it. And so that's more and more what we're trying to do with our research, is simply not give people information, but tell them what the information says, and more importantly, then what they do with it. So just a little bit of information from the recent U.S. survey on, on farming. It's interesting. Uh, people generally in the U.S. have a relatively positive impression of farming. Now, we don't know what they think farming is, uh, but when they think about farming, uh, this is what they normally say. And I also found it really interesting that 56% say they know a little bit about farming, 19% say they know a lot. 
which is amazing, because I'd really like to know what they know and what they think they know about farming. Wouldn't that really be fun to just go out and say, okay, so you say you know a lot about agriculture. Tell me what you know and see how well it actually aligns with what happens on today's farms, whether they be crop farms or livestock operations. We also know that people are getting their information from lots of different sources, so people are crowdsourcing knowledge today. We used to think in agriculture, we're gonna have a single organization that's going to be the oracle, that's going to be the single place that people go for information. Doesn't happen today. People get their information from lots of different sources, and we'll talk about that, but we can leverage that actually to our advantage as we think about how we go forward. Because we know that the old communication model simply doesn't work today. We used to hope that we could get Dr. Know-it-all from Home State University. Uh, he or she would go do some research, bring the tablets down from the mount, share that with consumers, and everybody would be satisfied, right? That data and those consumer insights would be sufficient, and people would be okay with that, and they would move forward, and life would be grand. That doesn't work today in today's tribal network communication model, where again, people are crowdsourcing their information. I might get a little bit of information online, I might get something from a Facebook friend, I might get something from my mom, I might get something from someone else, and I synthesize all of that in a way that's consistent with my values to inform my opinions, beliefs, or attitudes about a particular topic. And so we see that happening continuously, and rather than connecting all of us, what the internet has done is created an infinite number of tribes of special interest. So each of us looks for information, but we can, we can only look at, for information in a way that's consistent with our values. We choose our confirmation bias because no one can manage an unlimited amount of information. So we have to sort and sift that in a way that's relevant to us, but in so doing, we limit our ability to have broader social conversations about really important topics. Here's the good news is, you are a trusted source of information when it comes to consumers. When we ask consumers, rate your level of trust in these sources of information, this is the percentage of those who gave it a top box score for trust. So family doctor, top, and then family, and then really pretty consistently, university scientists, dietitians, friends, nutrition advocacy group, and farmers. So people trust you to give them information about agriculture. And that's a phenomenal asset that you have. There's so many assets that farmers have. There are great reasons for you to be leading this conversation and to be participating in this conversation, but understanding we have to do so in today's network model. Because no longer is anybody going to go to this organization or that organization only as their single source of information. So we really have to participate and understand the crowdsource knowledge of where we're moving. So I want to transition from that little brief snapshot of research and talk about the power of shared values because if you take nothing else away today from my half hour with you, I hope you'll take this because this is the single most important thing that we're going to talk about today. We know that at the end of the day, the greatest asset we can have, the most popular, the most important thing we can do is to build trust. And trust is really a belief that your activities are consistent with broad social expectations, that your behavior is consistent with the way that stakeholders believe you should behave. And when you have that, they grant you that social license and the freedom to operate, the social license that Andrea was talking about, which is really the privilege of operating with minimal formalized restrictions based on maintaining public trust. So social license is a privilege. Any license is a privilege. It's not a right. And that privilege, again, is granted by maintaining that level of trust, which ultimately then results in your freedom to operate. And today we see companies, as well as regulators and others, being the arbiters for whether or not you have social license. So Coles and Woolies can decide whether or not what you do on the farm is going to be accepted, is going to be allowed. And others can as well. If your packer decides, you know what, our customer no longer wants that, forget about it. If there's too much negative publicity about musing, there's too much negative publicity about live export, some brands might decide, you know what, we're gonna find another source or if we're simply going to say, you can no longer do that if you wanna be part of our supply chain. And so social license ends up being regulated not just by legislation and regulation, but by market forces as well in today's environment. And there's real economic to maintaining social license. And we'll talk about that and how you should think about it as an asset that's worth investing to protect because it truly is. Because when you operate with a social license, you're generally granted that because you operate in a way consistent with the ethics, values, and expectations of your stakeholders. And there's some kind of self-regulatory process that demonstrates to them you're doing what's right. So whether that's an animal welfare certification program or some kind of environmental stewardship measurement program, but generally there's some way that you can demonstrate to your stakeholders, hey, we've got this. We're going to take care of it. We, make, we understand it's important to you. Here's our program to make sure we're operating in a way consistent with your expectations. When you do that, the system you have generally then is more flexible, responsive, and lower cost. So it gives you the opportunity to be more responsive to changing market conditions, changes in social expectations for whatever happens. 
But then if you cross a tipping point, could be a single event or a series of events, like undercover videos, uh, all of a sudden things can change, and they can change just like that. And I worked in the pork industry when this happened, and we saw it devastate our business. We knew because we had a number of environmental spills and the regulations that changed, we made ourselves significantly less competitive. Our cost of environmental compliance was six times the cost of our competitors in other states. So social license has significant economic value, and it's guided social control. Once you lose that social license, it's all about regulation, legislation, litigation, and compliance. Much more rigid, much more bureaucratic, and much higher cost. And so really what it ends up doing is it speeds consolidation. Because once you have more social control, only the larger, more sophisticated, more integrated firms actually have the resources to compete. And so it really limits the ability of smaller operators to continue to be competitive once that social license is gone.